The challenge of the Yukon. <laughs> it's Yukon King, swiftest and strongest lead dog of the Northwest, blazing the trail for Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police in his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. On King, on you husky. <laughs> gold, gold discovered in the Yukon. A stampede to the Klondike in the wild race for riches. Back to the days of the gold rush with Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog, Yukon King, as they meet the challenge of the Yukon. The Polar Star Mine was near the top of Lookout Mountain. And it wasn't often that Sergeant Preston stopped there. His rare visits, however, were always great events for Buddy Stewart, the foreman's son. Once, the sergeant brought the boy a pair of skis and taught him how to use them on the mountain trails. It was on his next visit that they found Blaze. They were following the twisting, turning trail that led down through the forest on the south slope of the mountain to the Indian village at the bottom. <laughs> King was romping at their side when he suddenly disappeared among the trees. A moment later, he was back on the trail, barking excitedly, and the sergeant and Buddy stopped in a flurry of snow. Oh. What's the matter, boy? He found something in the woods he wants you to investigate. All right, King, lead the way. The Indians set traps in here. I know, Buddy. We've had a new snow. There's no way to see them. Don't worry about King, son. He can smell them. <laughs> Or a young wolf. He sounds like a puppy. And look at the white mark on his chest. Wolves aren't marked like that. He's part wolf. He's wild, that's certain. Oh, he's such a little fellow. What's he doing out here by himself? No other tracks around. Something must have happened to his mother. Oh, the traps caught his leg. We'll set him free and take a look at it. <laughs> Easy, little fellow. <laughs> there, there. I'll try not to hurt you. The leg's broken? Yes, it is. Can you fix it? I think so, buddy. Get me a stick about so long. Oh, sure. The sergeant set the broken leg and applied a splint. The puppy yelped in protest. When the splint was firmly bandaged, he was content to nestle inside the sergeant's parka as the sergeant and Buddy started up the trail toward the mine. I'm going to call him, please. You're going to keep him? Oh, of course. Might be all right for a while. My pa won't mind. He said I could have a dog as a pet. Blaze may be too much wolf to make a good pet. Honest? It's possible. You'll have to wait a few months, buddy. He may learn to like you so much, he'll forget the forest. Only time will tell, though. That was how Blaze came to be adopted by the Stewarts. His broken leg healed, and as he grew, he seemed perfectly content to play with Buddy and follow him everywhere he went. But a year later, there was a change. Fully grown now, Blaze would sometimes disappear from the camp for days at a time. When he would return... Where have you been? I ought to teach you a lesson, Blaze. Oh, I'm not going to beat you, but I'm going to tie you up and I'm going to keep you tied up. Now, come on. And don't you growl at me when I take hold of your collar, you hear? Being chained was an experience that Blaze hated. It seemed to bring his wolf nature closer to the surface. And day and night, he would lift his head to the skies and howl. Eventually, his howling got on the men's nerves, and a conference was held in Adam Churchill's office. Adam owned the Polar Star, and with him in the office were Rex Cooper, the company bookkeeper, and Matt Stewart, Buddy's father. Buddy sat facing the three men. It was Adam who spoke first. Buddy, Blaze has been howling for the last hour. Yes, sir. I don't think he'll stop for another hour. No, sir. A man can stand just so much, Buddy. Yes, sir. And I've stood it. That's all I have to say. Yes, sir. Buddy. Yes, Mr. Cooper. What you must realize is that Blaze is more wolf than dog. You can't keep him tied up. But if I don't, he'll run away. Son, you don't want to be cruel, do you? No, Pa. Well, that's what it amounts to. Tying Blaze up is worse than beating him. You can see that, can't you? Yes, Pa. Well, what are you going to do about it? I'll set him free, Pa. Good boy. Oh, thank you, buddy. Now perhaps we'll get some sleep around here. 
When Blaze was set free, he thanked Buddy by licking his hand. He looked up into the boy's face for a long moment. And then he turned and ran out of the camp and into the forest. <laughs> He never returned to the camp. But sometimes at night, Buddy would climb to the ridge above the mine with a choice cut of caribou steak. And sometimes Blaze would visit him there. Blaze would eat the steak, and the boy and the wolf dog would play together. But when Buddy started down the slope to the camp, Blaze would stay behind. His home was in the forest now. Good night, Blaze. The situation might never have changed if it weren't for something that happened down in Skagway the following winter. Rex Cooper made the long trip to the American port to pick up some equipment which had been shipped from the States. The skipper of the Portland Queen had bad news for him. It isn't about your equipment. That'll be unloaded tomorrow morning. Well, then? Adam Churchill's niece booked passage with us in Portland. Beth Martin, the girl who lives in New York, his only relative. But Adam had no idea she was coming up here. At least he said nothing to me, and he would have. Where is she? Wait a minute. You said bad news. Yes. The girl was ill when she came on board. Pneumonia. The ship's doctor did everything he could for her. But two days out from Portland, she died. That... That's tragic. Yes. Under the circumstances, there was only one thing to do. She was buried at sea. Oh? Now, uh, uh, here's a death certificate. Will uh, you take charge of her belongings and her papers? Of course. You'll explain to Mr. Churchill we did our best. I'm sure you did. It will be a shock for Adam, but of course he never saw her. There's only more. What? Nothing. The uh, papers, I'd like to see them. Oh, all right. Uh, let's see now. Here they are. Thank you. Rex Cooper was a good accountant and a shrewd man, but he was bitter over the fact that in a land where so many men made fortunes, he was forced to work for a salary. As he looked through Beth Martin's papers, an idea came to him, an idea that could only lead to murder. The photograph of Beth's mother reminded him of a girl who sang at the El Dorado, and his idea became a decision. That night, he talked with the girl, Ann Merrill, at a corner table in the cafe. You don't like it here, do you, Ann? I hate it. Why don't you quit? Well, I intend to as soon as I make enough money to pay for my passage back to the States. Do you have any family there? No, but I won't have to work in a cafe. How would you like to make $1,000? <laughs> Very much. But the question is, how? $1,000 in expenses. You'd only have to take a trip up to the Polar Star Mine on Lookout Mountain. You may have heard of the owner. His name is Adam Churchill. No. He's an old man and not in the best of health. I have some news that will be a great shock to him. Might be too much for him. I'd like to spare him if it's at all possible. You see, he has a niece. I should say... Rex Adam. described the way in which Beth Martin had died, and then he made his proposition. Anne was startled. You want me to take the girl's place? Yes, but it's impossible. Why? Oh, it just is. Not at all. Adam never saw Beth. And you happen to look a great deal like Beth's mother. Here's her picture. Well, I suppose there is a resemblance. A marked resemblance. Well, still, that isn't enough. Why isn't it? Well, I don't know anything about the girl. Well, neither does Adam. She must have written to him. Not very often. When her mother died, perhaps every six months since then. And I've read the letters. I can tell you everything that was in them. Adam and his niece were strangers, believe me. Well, then why should it make so much difference to him, the fact I that I say he's... strangers, but Beth was his last living relative, and he always looked forward to the day when they would meet. I'd like to see him have that pleasure before he dies. You want me to go up to the Polar Star and stay? How long? A month or two. Then what? You go back to the States. Still pretending I'm Beth Martin? Why not? Well, it wouldn't stop there. He'd expect letters from me. He'd expect to keep in touch with me. Is there anything wrong in that? A little make-believe on your part and you'll make an old man's last years happier. You have no family. Why shouldn't you adopt an uncle? Well, if you put it that way... A thousand dollars in expenses. It's a lot of money. It's yours. And you honestly think I could get away with it? I honestly do. 
Well, as you say, why not? Rex had his own reasons for deciding that Anne shouldn't travel back to Lookout Mountain with him. Instead, he gave her enough money to cover her expenses, and she left Skagway a week after he did on a mail sled. In Dawson, she went directly to the offices of the Northwest Mounted Police. How do you do? I'm Beth Martin. How do you do? I'm Sergeant Preston. Do you happen to know my uncle, Adam Churchill? Oh, of course. He's an old friend. Well, I want to pay him a surprise visit. Uh, Well, I've made it to Dawson, all right, but what do I do now? Is there some place in town where I can hire a dog sled and a driver to take me to Lookout Mountain? Why should you hire anyone? Well, that's... Well, I don't understand. (laughs) I'm heading for an Indian village on the far side of Lookout Mountain tomorrow morning. I'll be glad to take you as a passenger, and of course there'll be no charge. Why, thank you, Sergeant. Thank you very much. And that was how it happened that Sergeant Preston escorted Anne on the last stage of her journey to Lookout Mountain. When Buddy saw them coming, he raced down the trail to meet them. Oh, 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 oh. Sergeant Preston and King! Hello! Hello, Buddy! Hooking! Oh, 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 oh. Hello! Who are you? My name is Beth. Beth Martin. Oh, Beth? Buddy's father is your uncle's foreman. Is Mr. Churchill your uncle? That's right. Oh, golly. Are you going to stay here with us? For a while, but Nobody told me you were coming. Nobody knew it. This is a surprise. Oh, I'll say. Can you ski? <laughs> well, I'm afraid not. Well, you're pretty anyway. <laughs> oh, thank you, Buddy. Hello. Hello. Your uncle will be in the office, Beth. Let's go inside. All right. <laughs> Rex, this is Adam's niece. Come in, come in. It's Beth, isn't it? Yes, it's Beth, Mr. Cooper. Rex Cooper. Mr. Churchill, a surprise for you. What's that? What's going on in here? Sergeant Preston. And the young lady who's come a long way to pay you a visit. Well, I don't believe I've had the pleasure. No, Uncle Adam. You haven't. Uncle? You're Beth. I... Yes. My dear... My dear, of course. Yes, you have Mary's eyes. You're very much like her. But why didn't you let me know? Well, I was afraid you wouldn't let me come. If you don't want me to stay, I'll go. Want you to stay? Indeed we do. I'm only finding it hard to believe our good fortune. She can't ski. (laughs) (laughs) Well, well, you shall teach her, buddy. And we have a new cabin, my dear. That shall be yours. Welcome. Welcome to Lookout Mountain. Adam ordered a holiday for all the men, and a feast was prepared to celebrate Anne's arrival. Afterwards, the sergeant drove on to the Indian village. That night, there was a knock on the door of Anne's cabin. Who's there? It's Rex. Come on in. Is this wise? Yours is the only light in the camp. Everyone else is asleep. I wanted to reassure you. You did very well today. Well, I don't like it. (laughs) Well, you certainly won't like what I'm going to tell you now. What do you mean? Adam's guessed there's something wrong? He won't guess anything until it's much too late. Too late? You're not leaving here, Anne. Well, I suppose I can play the game for a month or two. It does seem to make Adam happy to have me here. He doesn't look well. I suppose if he were to learn the truth... The truth is that Beth Churchill was murdered... well, you said that... I know what I said. But you showed me the death certificate. A forgery. By whom? By you? You forged that paper? Perhaps. But why? So that you would agree to what I propose. I'm not getting mixed up in any murder. I'm going straight to Adam and tell You'll him... You'll sit to... down. You take your hands off me. Hold your tongue and listen. There are men in Skagway who will swear that Beth Churchill was last seen alive in your company. I don't care what they swear. A few weeks later, you arrive at Lookout Mountain pretending to be Beth. If the police ever find out about her death, you'll be accused of murder, and there's no way you can prove your innocence. You tricked me into coming up here to cover up what you did. Why did you kill her? (laughs) I didn't. You did. That's a lie. Listen, you won't be accused of anything as long as you keep your mouth shut. You'll be perfectly safe as long as you're Beth Martin. Now, be reasonable. And let me explain how much it will mean to both of us. It means nothing to me. You are Adam's only heir. When he dies, you'll own the polar star. I won't. If you think I'm going to keep up this horrible pretense for years, you're crazy. Who said anything about years? It might be only a few days. He isn't that ill. No. But sometimes when he can't sleep, he goes to the mine at night. 
There might be an accident. I see. An accident? It would seem to be one. It could even happen tonight. I see. And afterwards? I've told you, you're his heir. The Polar Star is worth hundreds of thousands, and it will all go to you, except for the half that goes to me. <laughs> oh, silence is golden. It's fair enough, isn't it? I'd be rich. We'd both be rich. And you would take care of the accident? Of course. The first time Adam inspects the mine after the rest of the camp is asleep. How about those men in Skagway? Can you trust them? I'll take care of them. And you're sure there's no way in which we could be caught? No way. Well, there's no choice, is there? I either play the game your way or hang for murder. That's it. I'll play the game. <laughs> Good girl. Good night. And pleasant dreams. The company dogs were kept in a run near the Stewart cabin. About midnight, Buddy was wakened by their barking. He ran to the window to see what was the matter. It was a bright night, and he could see someone trying to harness a team. It was the girl. Quickly, Buddy slipped into his clothes and ran outside. Hey, what's the idea? Buddy... Buddy, will you help me? Will you help me harness this team? What for? I must get Sergeant Preston. Please help me. What do you want with the sergeant? Oh, he's needed here. It's a matter of life and death. It is? Help me harness the team. Well, there's no sense in taking a team. The sergeant has his own. Yes, but I must get there. Well, what I mean is, there's no sense in your going. I could make it down to the village in no time at all on my skis. Then I could ride back up with the sergeant. What's he needed for? What's the matter of life and death? I can't explain, buddy, but please, would you go? Would you give him the message? It's life or death. Oh, sure, I'll go. Go on, get back in there, Sam. I'll be on my way in two seconds, just as soon as I get my skis. Well, hurry, buddy. The trail curved down the wooded slope in such a way that the angle of descent was fairly gradual. But there was only a small cover of powdered snow on the crust, and the going was fast. The turns were sharp, and Buddy, spurred on by Ann's message, made no effort to check his speed. Toward the bottom of the slope, he went into one of the turns too fast. He cracked into a tree. He caromed off, and as he hit the ground, a sharp rock cut his cheek. He lay absolutely still. A wolf howled, and a few minutes later, two gaunt, half-starved creatures began to circle the unconscious boy. They moved closer and closer. But just as they were about to spring, a larger wolf crashed through the underbrush. A patch of white fur gleamed on his chest. It was Blaze. He threw himself between Buddy and the wolves and warned them off. There was no stopping them now, though, and both of them attacked Blaze. King was buried deep in the snow outside the lodge where his master was sleeping. Still, the sound of the battle reached him, and he jumped to his feet, searching the breeze with his nose. There were wolves up there on the wooded slope. There was also a man, a boy. It was the boy who lived on top of the mountain. <coughs> King threw himself against the door of the lodge, barking a demand for the sergeant's attention. Yeah, what's the matter, King? Hmm? Trouble up the mountain? Sounds like wolves to me, fella, but I'll follow if you insist. <coughs> King routed the other dogs out of their burrows. And when the sergeant came out of the cabin dressed for the trail, they were lined up in front of the sled. We need the sled, do we? It was only a matter of seconds to harness the team. Up front, boy. On King! On you, Husky! King was allowed to run free as a loose lead, and he charged up the trail ahead of the team. By the time he reached the turn where Buddy still lay unconscious on the ground, two other wolves had joined the attack on Blaze. Blaze's strength was ebbing fast, but now King took over the defense of the helpless boy, whirling and slashing, driving the snarling brutes back. As the sergeant drove up, he fired over their heads. Then they turned tail and ran. Oh, you husky, what a hole. But Blaze didn't run. He crouched beside Buddy and looked up into the sergeant's face, asking him with his eyes to help the boy. He'll be all right, Blaze. Yes, buddy? That's Blaze. I think he saved your life. Wait till I take your skis off. 
What are you doing here this time of night? Beth sent me for you. She said it was life and death. Huh? What's happened? I don't know. That's all she said. Well, I'll put you on the sled and cover you up. Well, there. Here, King. I'd better harness you for the uphill pull. Steady, boy. That does it. All set, buddy? I'm fine. On, King! On, you husky! Sergeant, please, he's following us. Yes, he's going to make sure you're taken care of. Master King, on, you husky! After Buddy left the camp, Anne sat by the window in her darkened cabin, waiting for him to return with the sergeant. Suddenly, a light showed in Adam's cabin. Cooper said when he can't sleep that he may be going to the mine now. I've got to stop him. My dear. Please. What's the matter? Are you afraid? The wolves? No, I'm not afraid of the wolves. I'm afraid of a man. Rex Cooper is planning to kill you. Beth, you've been having a bad dream. You don't know what you're saying. Yes, I do. And I'm not Beth. Huh? Cooper hired me to come up here and pretend I was your niece. My name is Ann Merrill. I've been singing at the El Dorado in Skagway. Uh, Cooper hired you? Why should he do a thing like that? Because he means to kill you. Your life is in danger. I'm ready to make a full confession as soon as Sergeant Preston gets here. But I saw the light in your window and I was afraid you might be going to the mine. I was. The shoring in one of the tunnels Stay is Stay here. That's all I ask. Stay here until the sergeant arrives and then we... <laughs> well, a charming domestic scene. Why the gun, Cooper? Don't raise your voice, either of you. How much have you told a man? Anne, my name is Beth. You've been talking too much. I can see it in your face. That's too bad. You probably told him everything. She told me enough. I thought so. But I didn't believe a word of it until I saw that gun in your hand. Just why do you want to kill me? The plan's been spoiled. Anne and I were to share your mind after you died. He didn't tell me what he planned to do until tonight. Beth is dead, Mr. Churchill. How she died, I don't know. Down in Skagway, Cooper told me it was pneumonia, and he wanted me to come up here to... Oh, it sounds fantastic. To keep you from learning the truth about Beth, to save you from the shock. <laughs> and tonight he told me she'd been murdered, and that I'd been framed for it. He threatened to turn me over to the police unless I took orders from him. Oh, Mr. Churchill, I swear that I didn't have anything to do with any killing. I don't know whether your niece is dead or not. I only know that this man is stark staring mad. That's enough. He said there'd be an accident in the mine. I had to keep you from going You're there. You're both going there. You mean to kill us both? Yes, tonight. You're crazy. There's to be an accident, a cave-in. What can you possibly gain from our deaths? After you've gone, I'll find a will, Mr. Churchill. The polar star will be left to me. Now, I've wasted enough time. Get moving. We're headed for the mine. The sergeant stopped his team in front of Anne's cap. Oh, King! Oh, you husky! Oh, no! Just a second, King. I'll unharness you. You'd think she'd hear it. She was so anxious, you'd think she'd be waiting up. There you are, boy. There's a light in Adam's cabin. She may be over there, but we'll knock here first. Beth! No one in here. Come on, King. The sergeant hurried across to Adam's cabin and looked in the window. Empty. There are fresh tracks in the snow. Heading for the mine. Seem to be. Here, King. Follow the trail. You go home, buddy. I no, I don't it? like the looks of this. That said life and death. Go on, King. Go on, boy. Down this tunnel. You recognize it, Mr. Churchill? The one where the shoring is weak. An accident in here won't be unexpected, will it? What do you intend to do? Pull the shoring down on our heads? That's all arranged. Stop a minute. See? Blasting powder behind these timbers. All I have to do is light the fuse. And be buried with us. Hardly. You two are going to march on down to the end of the tunnel. Move or I'll shoot. Come on, Ann. Right. That's it. A little farther. Yeah. Better. Now I'm going to light the fuse. It'll be time for me to get out of the tunnel, but not for you. Because I'm going to keep you covered as I back up. I'll shoot if you move. Remember that. A match. And the fuse is lit. Stay where you are. What? Hey. The sergeant saw what was happening as he entered the tunnel. He brought the barrel of his gun down on Cooper's head, knocking him to the ground. Then he sprinted onto the charge of blasting powder, pulled out the fuse and stamped on it. Adam, where are you? Right here, sergeant. 
Come on, Rex, however, hadn't been knocked out. He leveled his revolver at the sergeant. But King was watching him, and his jaws closed on Cooper's gun hand. No, no. The gun fell from his grasp, and a moment later, the sergeant snapped a pair of handcuffs on his wrist. Good work, King. He won't bother us anymore. Sergeant, you saved our lives. So it seems. I had no idea that Cooper was such a dangerous character. Nor had I, but there's no doubt about it. He meant to kill us both. And I'll tell you why, Sergeant. I'll be glad. That can wait till we get above ground. On your feet, Cooper. All right. Later, in Adam's cabin, when Anne had finished her story... And Beth was murdered, and you believe Cooper killed her? She wasn't murdered. The death certificate was perfectly genuine. She died on the way from Portland. She was buried at sea. That can be checked easily enough. It's true. And you lied to me just to make me help you with your awful scheme. Ah, oh, little fool. Watch it, Cooper. The charge against you is attempted murder. You're under arrest in the name of the Crown. I warn you that anything you say may be taken down and used in evidence against you. I'll take him to his cabin. Sergeant, are you going to arrest me? Well, I suppose you could be charged with conspiracy to defraud if Adam wants to press charges. Oh, nonsense. Nothing of the kind. She only wanted to keep an old man from feeling alone in the world. <laughs> What's more, she succeeded. I admire your courage, Anne. I may have lost the niece I never saw, but I feel that I've gained a daughter. Mr. Churchill. I'll leave you two to talk it over. Come on, Cooper. All right. Yes, I know. As the sergeant and Cooper stepped outside, Buddy raised the bedroom window and called across to him. Everything under control, Sergeant? Everything's under control, Buddy. That was only a scratch on my cheek. I'm glad, son. And you know what? What, Buddy? Blaze is sleeping at the foot of my bed. I don't think he'll ever leave me again. I don't think so either, Buddy. You get back to bed now. Come on, Cooper. The girl finds a home, but his dog comes back, and you go to jail. This case is closed. In our next adventure... Two men are sitting at a corner table in the cafe at Gold Ledge, talking in low tones. I am sure, Bull. He is pretending to be an ordinary dog puncher in order to get evidence against us. The man is really Sergeant Preston. What are we going to do, Rasta? It is up to you. Get rid of him. You will be traveling with him to Whitehorse and back. The gorge is the ideal place. A blow on the head and he drops over the side. It is impossible to recover the body. When you come back, you report an accident. It is the end of Sergeant Preston. Yes, Sergeant Preston's disguise has been penetrated. A gang of desperadoes have decided he must die, and the spot for the murder has been picked. The trail that rims the edge of the precipice. Don't miss this next exciting adventure. These radio dramas, a feature of the challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, are created by George W. Trendle, produced by Trendle Campbell Enterprises, directed by Fred Flowerday, and supervised by Charles D. Livingston. The part of Sergeant Preston is played by Paul Sutton. The challenge of the Yukon is brought to you every Saturday and Sunday. This is J. Michael wishing you goodbye and good luck until our next adventure. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.